I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. One of the most difficult aspects in starting to study Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah is getting a handle on just how those ideas developed over time. It's tempting to think that, for instance, Kabbalah has just always existed in the form that we have it, or that Kabbalah is just one thing at all. Of course, neither of these positions is really tenable. Such notions developed greatly through the ages and are still developing, and there are now and there have always been numerous mutually exclusive schools of Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah. This class is meant to serve as an introduction to Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah from the point of view of its incredibly complex development from the prophets of ancient Israel unto the rise of modern Hasidism in the 18th century. Of course, this series isn't meant to be exhaustive by any means, but only should serve as a springboard for deeper study and reflection, and hopefully it will also enable you to situate developments in Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah in their historical and cultural context, and hopefully embolden you to dive into the primary texts, which are admittedly as sublime as they are obscure. Let me express my gratitude to Congregation Tchia for allowing me to use these lectures to reach a larger audience here on Esoterica. If you want, you can find the entire series under the playlist Entering the Garden, an Introduction to Jewish Mysticism and Kabbalah. I'll be uploading them over the next few weeks, or if you find these episodes after autumn of 2021 and you want to watch the entire series, you can find them in that playlist. If you find this series on Kabbalah interesting, I'd hope you check out my other content on topics in esotericism and perhaps consider supporting the production of free academic and scholarly topics in occultism, hermetic philosophy by joining my Patreon or perhaps with a one-time donation. You can find those links below and I really appreciate your consideration. Now, Let's enter the garden of Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah. Well, I want to say welcome back. Uh, welcome back this evening to the second part of our 10-minute, uh, our 10-session romp through Jewish uh, mysticism and Kabbalah. And as we talked about last time, right, and Kabbalah, right, we're still 1,200 years away from, from, from Kabbalah. Uh, it's still way off in the distance. So we're still very much in the time period uh, right around the turn of the Common Era. That is to say around the year zero, right? That's if you want to get a, a, an anchor of where we, where we are. And just to recap a bit, right? Just to recap a little bit from last time to sort of see where we are in the lay of the land. Uh, we defined mysticism, at least for the purposes of this class, which doing things like defining mysticism makes it uh, certain that everybody will disagree with you that studies this stuff. So I'm just basically, anytime I say, I'm going to define mysticism, it's like putting a target on my back. Um, but the way that I want to define it is as a non-rational mode uh, in which one experiences or learns about fundamental reality and also the traditions that accrue around those experiences. So I would say, I would call someone, for instance, that studies mysticism for the, for the idea that those mystics learn fundamental truths even though perhaps that person themselves didn't have those experiences, I would also consider that person a mystic. So I would say that there's also the idea that you lean on the mystics to learn what they learned, and that puts you in the tradition of folks who are in fact mystics. Um, and there's an entire tradition in Judaism of what we'll call intellectual mystics. And we'll get to those much later. Uh, and intellectual mystics are those um, that say, look, I didn't, I never had this experience, but I trust that this person did, and I think that they're fundamentally right. So that's also, I think, another form of mysticism that actually doesn't involve mystical experiences. And as I mentioned last time, the first Jewish mystics weren't even Jewish. The first Jewish mystics were Israelites, which is a much broader category. Remember that the Jews uh, received that name, the Yehudim received that name as being the descendants of one of the tribes uh, that comprise the, the, the 12 tribes of Israel. And so Jewish mystics actually make up a minority of this. Uh, many of the, uh, the prophets we have in the Hebrew Bible are from all over. They're not necessarily Judahites. 
And we said that the, the two forms of mysticism that seem to have been prevalent in uh, Israelite society uh, at that time were uh, folks who experienced theophany, that is to say God showed up to them, God appeared to them. And on the other hand, uh, for other people, God spoke to them. And if you speak on the behalf of God, that makes you a, a Navi, a prophet. Um, although sometimes those folks are referred to as Roe, as seers. Um, but the idea there is that we have a, the idea that either those folks can see the future or they hear something from God and they communicate that to other people. And those folks uh, we typically refer to as, uh, as the prophets. And the most important theophanies in the Hebrew Bible, uh, historically speaking at least, we don't think that the, that the theophany described in Exodus where God showed up to the Israelites and uh, to Moses, we're fairly confident that that's a mythological uh, piece of information, not a historical one. But we are relatively confident, uh, many scholars are relatively confident that the prophets Isaiah and Ezekiel did have some kind of phenomenological encounter and that encounter uh, they recorded in, uh, in the literature uh, of the book of Isaiah and the book of Ezekiel, respectively. Uh, now, the idea that, now you might be wondering, right, how can you say that Moses didn't exist? Well, it's not about whether he did or didn't, it's about what we have evidence for. And we just don't have evidence, really, to believe that that happened. But we have over, we have pretty good evidence to believe that the experiences of Isaiah and Ezekiel were, in fact, recorded. And as we talked about last time, prophecy is very well attested all over the ancient Near East, with the weird exception of Egypt. Egypt is kind of prophet free, which all things being equal, sounds great. I wouldn't want to live around, I wouldn't want to live anywhere. I don't want any prophets in my neighborhood. I don't want any guy walking down my street screaming at people because they're like, woe to the disbelievers, Yahweh is going to kill you all. I'm like, I'm going to call the cops on you again. Um, so I don't want to live anywhere, anywhere near prophets. And so Egypt seems like a pretty great place to be prophet free. But at any rate, uh, we saw last time that there are a great deal of prophets that live all through the ancient Near East, and especially in the Neo-Assyrian context, which tracks very carefully, very like actually very temporally to the ancient Israelite context. And so we actually know a great deal about, uh, or a good deal about those ancient and other ancient Near East prophets. We also know that one of the things that happened in the ancient Near Eastern world were prophetic duels. They just didn't take prophets' words for granted because they kind of seem crazy. Uh, and if they seem crazy to you, they seem kind of crazy to people back then too, right? Um, you know, just because you see Jesus in your toast doesn't mean Jesus is in your toast. It might be that you, you, you might need help. Um, and so many people in the ancient world also thought, right, this guy's just drunk, right? And there's many cases in the Bible where people do prophecy and people, other people are like, yeah, they're drunk. Um, and so this was an idea. And so we see other ancient Near East cultures engaging in prophecy and other mechanisms by which to detect whether a prophecy is reliable or, or uh, duels between prophets to establish which prophets are actually telling the truth. Uh, prophetic duels needs to be a video game, just saying. Um, yeah, it's a fighting game, but with prophets. Um, and the, what brings prophecy to an end and what sets us up for our transition to tonight is that, as you might remember, part of what happens in the, the theophany literature of the Hebrew Bible is that the God of the Israelites, Yahweh, makes itself, makes themselves known by revealing a bunch of very inconvenient rules. And by revealing all these very inconvenient rules, the idea is that the Israelites are bound to follow those rules and Yahweh will protect them and give them land uh, and, and provide for them to have uh, large families and agricultural surplus. Well, what ends up happening is that for various reasons, the Israelite state is destroyed and the Judean state is destroyed. And as you might imagine, when your entire theology is founded on a vassal contract, right, and your vassal, the person who justifies your vassal relationship gets defeated, well, that's the end of that. And so again, it's like if you're living in a house and your, uh, your landlord uh, gets bought out by, I don't know, some sketchy uh, uh, investment firm, well, you got a new landlord. You have no longer a relationship with old landlord. Well, now you got to deal with other gods. And so the Israelites have some pretty, com pretty complicated problems in their hands. And the pretty complicated problem on their hand is we've predicated an entire theology on one system and it didn't work. Our God seems like either got us defeated or we're defeated and what now, right? What do you do now with the awkward relationship with your former landlord? And so what's gonna happen is that prophecy, the idea that there are people speaking on behalf of Yahweh, what's gonna happen is that's going to increasingly go away, right? And a new form of religiosity is going to emerge. 
And that new form of religiosity that's going to emerge is going to be a new kind of mysticism. And that new kind of mysticism is what scholars typically refer to as the apocalyptic. All right, Tanakh pop quiz. You didn't know, but you know this was coming. Um, so Tanakh pop quiz, and this is a trick question because of course it is. You're in a class about mysticism. Um, does anyone here know, and feel free to put it in the chat, where in the Tanakh are the events surrounding the Hanukkah story recorded? So I see Ashley say they're not. That's the answer that, that's, that's the less wrong answer. You're certainly right. They're not recorded straightforwardly. Anyone know where the events of the Hanukkah story are actually depicted in the Tanakh, not in the Apocrypha, like in the book of Maccabees, where they're literally described, but in Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, as you may know it. Everybody's like, why you ask me damn questions like this? I'm the one taking this class, right? So actually, you are right. It is not described transparently in Tanakh. It is, however, described encodedly, encodedly, encodedly in the book of Daniel. It is actually encoded in the book of Daniel. Now, uh, the book of Daniel was probably the least read Jewish book in the Hebrew Bible. It's in some ways one of the most confusing, but uh, historical scholars, scholars of the Hebrew Bible, scholars of the book of Daniel are fairly confident that encoded in a very elaborate system of symbols the uh, story of the conquest of Syria, Judea by Alexander the Great, the civil wars between his generals uh, that led to the, um, the various empires like the Ptolemies uh, and the Seleucids, uh, also with the rise of the Romans and the period of the Maccabean rebellion are in fact described using coded language in the book of Daniel in chapters seven through 12. If you've never read the book of Daniel, it's a very weird book. And, and by the way, it's only it's one of the few books in the Hebrew Bible that actually has extensive sections actually written in Aramaic. Um, in the in a chapter seven through twelve, there is a section that is encoded using a very elaborate system of symbols that describes all the things I just put out. Now, what's very interesting about this this uh, section of the book of Daniel is that the writer, whoever's writing it, is describing the very beginning of the Maccabean rebellion, right? But they never describe the end of it. Now that leaves an open question. Why don't they describe the eventual success of the Maccabeans? And they're very pro-Maccabean, at least well, not, they're kind of tempered on the Maccabeans actually, uh, which a lot of people were because they were terrifying to anyone that wasn't a religious zealot. Uh, everybody in this class will be killed by the Maccabees, just FYI, um, everybody. Uh, they, they would have gladly killed all of us for being like not them. Um, which is always weird about Hanukkah. The Hanukkahs are a complicated idea if you're a progressive, liberal-minded Jewish person, uh, because you're like, yeah, I'm celebrating the very people that would have literally, the Taliban, the Taliban of Judaism. Um, at any rate, um, the we don't know why they don't finish. We don't know. They may have just died. You know, it, it was a war, and the Maccabees didn't like people who could, I don't know, read. Um, and so uh, they may have just gotten killed. It may have just gotten killed. And so uh, we, we, we don't see the end of it, but what's interesting about it is we now have a really good idea about when the book was written, at least those sections. They were written sometimes after the Maccabean revolt began, but before it ended. So we know it began around 160 and it concluded around 167 BCE. So we have a good idea about where that section of Daniel, when it was written down. Now, why would people encode things in strange language? Why would people encode things in weird symbols? Well, because there's a new kind of literature emerging, a new kind of religiosity emerging in the aftermath of the de demise of the prophetic period, and that new kind of religiosity is what we call apocalypticism. Um, also, by the way, uh, describing current events as if they're taking place far in the future is, a, is what we call in the literature ex eventu prophecy. Um, the vast majority of historical prophets did not predict the future. We'll talk more about the ones that tried and failed in a minute, but the vast majority of prophets who try to, who describe all kinds of weird things, and I'm sure folks have read some sections from the book of Daniel or the book of Revelations uh, written by, uh, by, by St. John, 
uh, or Nostradamus, right? If folks have read any Nostradamus, it's always weird stuff like an eagle, an eagle comes from the east and attacks the great bear and the bear follows the sun and the sun turns to blood and you're like, what in the hell are you talking about? They're not describing the future. They're actually describing the present using encoded language, right? It's, this is what we call ex eventu prophecy. They're describing things that have happened using codes. Why would they do that? Well, because it might be politically expedient to be a little cryptic, right? Because again, what is one of the things that these people like to do? Criticize the standard order of things. And do you really wanna be the, the person living in the Roman empire being like the Romans suck and I hate them and God's gonna kill them all soon. Do you wanna publish that? You don't wanna publish that because they'll crucify you for it. So what do you write? Well, the kit team, right, will arise from the sea and then blah, 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 right? You encode it. And the encoding mechanism is part of the apocalyptic literature. So what isn't apocalyptic? That's the first thing we need to do. I know, right, that when most people hear the word apocalypticism, they're thinking into the world. They're thinking all the crazy stuff happens in the end of the world. The Messiah is going to come and there's going to be this and that and the battle of Gog and Magog. And there's going to be all this stuff that happens at the end of the world, the battle of Megiddo, whatever. Um, and so many people typically imagine that what, uh, what apocalypticism is, is about the future, because the word apocalypticism has been filtered so heavily through Christianity, and Christianity does tend to think of the apocalypse as like something happening in the future, although early Christians thought it was going to happen pretty soon in their lifetime. Jesus is kind of dragging his feet, but um, they really thought it was going to happen soon, and this idea that it's going to happen in the future is uh, an idea really from Christianity that has sort of uh, uh, sh uh, shadowed and flavored the way that we use this word. Most apocalyptic writers, most prophets for that matter in the Hebrew Bible and the Jewish tradition don't do much in the way of trying to predict the future. They just don't. In fact, the most famous case where anyone tried to predict the future in the Hebrew Bible is in uh, the book of Ezekiel chapter 26, where Ezekiel made what at the time was the single most predictable prediction that one could predict. That is, Nebuchadnezzar would destroy Tyre. Well, he predicted that because Nebuchadnezzar was destroying everything, everything, right? It's, it, it, it's just like predicting, right? Like, like, it's like American imperialism will continue. Yep, it's going on, right? It, it, it's, it's, it's a completely normal thing to predict. And then they attacked Tyre and it didn't work. Nebuchadnezzar was repulsed. And so and Ezekiel himself actually has to come back later. He actually comes back in the same book and says, well, what I meant was he has to reinterpret his own prophecy to explain the fact that he was wrong, even though it was a completely actually predictable thing. So making predictions, especially clear predictions, is a bad idea, right? Make Folks may know the very famous quote from Frederick Nietzsche, right? It never hurts a prophet to be too vague, right? If you predict on Tuesday, March 22nd, 2029, that blah, 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 well, your prophetic career rests on that. And so most of the prophecies, they don't predict the future by and large, right? And in general, uh, this thing. By the way, that whole Nebuchadnezzar thing for people who are biblical literists is a real pain in their tuchus because they have to go back and explain why the Bible, why a prophet got it wrong, and then why a prophet admits that he got it wrong, and then how he put a spin on it to fix it. And then they further spin it to further fix it. Um, and the, my, my favorite example is, yeah, it eventually got conquered by Alexander the Great 400 years later. Somebody conquered it. So Ezekiel wasn't totally wrong. I'm like, I, I, really? That's, your, that's the best you got. Okay. Most Jewish apocalyptic texts just don't have much interest in the end of the world. In fact, when they do describe the end of the world, they almost always lean on Hellenistic ideas. And those Hellenistic ideas, specifically the Stoic idea, was that basically God was going to trash everything at the end, that there was going to be some kind of global com uh, conflagration, that the world would be ended, would be destroyed by a giant fire. That was a very common idea in the ancient world. And so in many ways, the predictions they do give about the end of the world are themselves just the popular ones. If you want to go to a, uh, to, a, to a Greek philosopher at the time and ask, what's going to happen at the end of the world? They say, the Logos, the fire is going to consume the whole world. And they're like, sounds reasonable. They went with that. So it's actually basically, a, it's not even really in some sense a Jewish idea as it is a Hellenistic idea, Greek idea. 
So let's put some context on this, right? We're gonna, I'm gonna say what the apocalyptic is in just a minute, but I wanna put some, I wanna put some context on this. What you have to understand about the rise of the apocalyptic is a time period in which it emerged, the political and theological upheavals that lasted from roughly about 586 BCE when Ju Judea was destroyed, the, the last independent Jewish state was destroyed, all the way up to around 135 of the common era where the last attempt at an independence movement on the, on the, on the, on the behalf of the, of the indigenous people of Judea, Jews against the Romans, led by Bar Kokhba was defeated with hundreds of thousands of Jewish people being killed in the process. What's important to understand about this political and theological landscape is that there is a major breakdown, as I mentioned earlier, in the theology of the time. As I mentioned earlier, right, this entire, this entire theology is built on what is called the Deuteronomic theology, which is again, the idea that Yahweh and Israel have a covenant and that covenant works in the way that the Israelites perform religious duties and Yahweh gives them stuff, right? Uh, so that is the way it's supposed to work. The prophets, their main, the way that they understood themselves was as sort of a voice for God telling the Israelites, you're doing wrong, you're breaking the contract, and if you persist in this, God's going to punish you. God's going to break the contract. Well, after everything comes completely apart, beginning in the 8th century BCE, but by the, 5th, by the 6th century BCE, the entire Judahite state is completely destroyed, there's just a serious problem. And the serious problem is, if the prophets were right, and if every single Judahite was massacred, well, that would have brought the prophecy to conclusion, right? You broke the treaty, and everyone's dead. Done, right? And that would have been a very neat and I say neat, I mean, not untidy, I mean, except for all the gore of everybody massacred, but it would have been a very tidy story theologically. Well, what happened? The Babylonians didn't kill everybody. They took the entire Judean aristocratic section into exile in Judea. And they kept on keeping on, not in the land, right? Not in their own land, but in Babylon. And not only that, they had a good time. We have extensive records of the Jewish population living in ancient Babylon. And we know they were living relatively well. They owned slaves. They had land. They had businesses, right? In fact, their life was so good in Babylon, in exile, that when the Jewish people were allowed to return to Israel, to Judea, by the Persians, many didn't want to go. They're like, why do I want to return to like, a rock that has no inhabitable land that's i can live here by these rivers and we can like live in good this is a great empire the, they didn't want to go home and so what you home right because they didn't they weren't born there they were diaspora jews living in babylon in comfort and security why go back to a wasteland to rebuild something right that isn't that great after all it's like a rock in the middle of the judean desert and this was a big problem. In fact, there had to be Jew, there had to be Jewish people actually pressuring them to go back. So again, when we talk about the Babylonian exile and weeping by the rivers of the of the Euphrates or whatever, a lot of those Jews were not weeping by those rivers. They were very happy to be in exile in Babylon. And we know that because we have records of them living there. The problem again is a theological problem. They're still there. They still believe in Yahweh. What do you do when the prophecy meant that you're supposed to be destroyed and you weren't destroyed? So does God make a new deal with us? It, do we, should we still believe in Yahweh? Like the temple's been destroyed. What's going on with, what do we do with this Yahweh thing? The covenant doesn't make sense anymore. The covenantal theology doesn't make sense because there's a remainder that contradicts it. So what do you do? What do you do? Well, there's a couple different options. You could try to maintain the old covenantal theology. And some people did try to do that. Some people did try to do that. But you can see the logical problem with trying to maintain it. The covenant's been broken. The, Juda the Judahite state's been destroyed and its aristocracy moved to Babylon. But they're still alive. What to do with that? That's a real problem. Well, what arises as a way of settling that problem right, the way of settling that problem is by shifting your theology. 
right? Never let a good catastrophe go to waste. You simply innovate your theology. And what ends up emerging is a new kind of Judahite theology. In fact, I might even argue that Israelite religion went into exile, but Judaism came back. The religion that the ancient Israelites practiced would be unrecognizable to anyone here. Like killing animals and burning, uh, kill, killing animals, burning beer and grain to appease a, a sky god. No one here recognizes a religion like that. But what comes out of exile is a theologically innovated, renovated religion that is much more like the Judaism that we might recognize now. So what happens is that they innovate. They theologically innovate. They develop a new, theolo a new theology that maintains the trappings of the old covenantal theology, but radically, uh, under, radically philosophically changes what it all means. And so what are those kinds of changes? The first big change is that Yahweh can't just be the God of Israel anymore. To make this work, Yahweh has to be a God of everything. Not just God of Israel and what the other gods being existing out there in the world, right? This is what we call henotheism, right? Your God exists, my God exists, but my God can beat up your God. That's what the Israelites basically believed. Now, the new shift is not only can my God beat up your God, your God's not real. There's just one God. Monotheism emerges in the aftermath of this catastrophe. So the God of the Israelites is now said to be the only God, and that God is responsible for everything. And not just responsible for everything, but responsible for everything forever. God has a plan for the entire cosmos, right? This is going to be decisively important. God is planning everything, and everything that happens is according to that plan, no matter how bad it is, no matter how confusing it is. In fact, the worse it is, is evidence for the fact that God is preparing something amazing, right? So this kind of theology is going to be decisively important in this matter. So what also has to happen here, right, is that the Israelites, right, are going to have to, are going to have to begin to change the way they think about their relationship to this, this, uh, to this God. And the problem is this God is going to have to tell them what in the world all this means? We're supposed to have this covenant and it's supposed to do like this. And this is supposed to happen if we keep it. And this is supposed to happen if we don't. Well, we didn't. And we're still here. What's happening? Well, what ends up happening, what ends up emerging is that new kinds of prophets emerge in which God shows them the plan. All right? Now, again, the language, hear the language here, right? The older prophets heard God and communicated what God said. The new kind of prophecy sees what God's showing them, right, and communicates what God shows, shows them in literature. So this is a much more literary movement, and it's a much more visual movement. And it's so distinct that we now think of it as a distinct kind of religiosity. It's not prophecy. They're not speaking on behalf of God. They're describing what God has shown them, what God has revealed to them, and that is a completely different phenomenological mode of experiencing mysticism, right? A very different kind of mysticism indeed. Now, what precipitates this? How do they get the ability to, how, what, what underwrites this? And the answer is really complicated. And the short answer is, we don't know. We don't know because we don't have good records about, it, it, we don't have good records about how this goes down. The best theory I've seen is that what ends up happening is that the Judahites go into exile and they come in contact with an up and coming important religion called Zoroastrianism. Now you have to understand that when the Judahite aristocracy goes into exile, the Judahite aristocracy is still a relatively, what's the right word to describe this here? The ancient Babylonians are like the New Yorkers of the ancient world. They're cosmopolitan, they're literate, they have an ancient, ancient culture that's been there for a thousand years. They are wealthy. They have multiple giant temples, each of which is larger than the Israelite temple. It, it, was a, it was a metropolis on an order of magnitude that the ancient Judahites could not imagine. Ancient Jerusalem was a backwater. It was a tiny settlement of a few thousand people, right, with that little temple there that was, you know, not much bigger than a basketball arena. Right? You're talking about an, an aristocracy that is a relatively backwater people 
coming into contact with an incredibly old, incredibly literate, right? When the Judites wanted to write diplomatic documents, they wrote it in the language of the Babylonians, Akkadian. When they arrive in Babylon, they must have been bowled over by the bumpkin hood of their existence compared to the Babylonians. Again, this is like, this is like the Mississippi aristocracy being conquered and then dragged off to New York, right? It, it, you just can't imagine the shell, the shell shock of what ha must have happened. Furthermore, they're coming in contact with a very dynamic new religion called Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism is, of course, uh, uh, a reform religion uh, founded by the prophet Zoroaster, who we don't know much about, even when he lived is not clear. But if I summarize Zoroastrianism to you, I bet it will sound immediately obvious what they believed. So Zoroastrianism is a basically dualistic religion that claims that a good God and an evil God are locked into a kind of battle for the destiny of the world. The forces of good are represented by non-physical spiritual entities, and those non-physical spiritual entities are in combat with other non-physical spiritual entities that serve the bad guys, angels and demons, right? We are, that structure is there. Now, this good versus evil dualism is going to result in a titanic, catastrophic battle at the end of time. The forces of good will win. They will throw the forces of evil into a neither world, right? And not only that, there are even Zoroastrian prophets who are given tours of the underworld. Those tours of the underworld filtered their way up to Europe, and we're fairly confident that Dante Alighieri was influenced by them. The Divine Comedy is probably being influenced by these tours of hell of the Zoroastrian literature. Now, near the end of the world, there's going to be a savior figure, Saoshant, who will lead the forces of good against the forces of evil. And at the end of time, everyone will be resurrected bodily. They will be judged, right? And there is a massive set of literature, right, being composed by Zoroaster. And the idea is that your relationship to scripture is more important in many ways than uh, doing sacrifice like sacrificing animals. Those priests, by the way, are called Magi. You may recognize them from the Bible, right? Those are the guys that show up to adore the baby Jesus. At any rate, that should all sound pretty familiar to most of us. If you take a little Judaism and add a little Zoroastrianism to it, shake it up in your cocktail shaker, pour in a glass, you have all the ingredients for a great cocktail called Christianity or Islam or apocalyptic Judaism. Now, again, many people detest the idea that Judaism could be influenced, informed, changed by non-Jewish pagan people. I got news for you. When the Jewish people arrived in this area, they would have viewed the Zoroastrians as a completely intellectually superior group of people. And I can guarantee you they would have been influenced by them. They would have been influenced by them. So Zoroastrianism probably has a huge impact. In fact, many ways, uh, Zoroastrianism has a huge impact in world religions in general. They also have a huge impact in music. You may know Freddie Mercury is a lead singer of Queen. He was a Zoroastrian. Um, so thank God for Zoroastrians. Um, they, they, produced, um, they produced at least Freddie Mercury, among all of you. So sadly, it's a threatened religion now. It's a very tiny religion, primarily located in Iran, uh, America, and in, um, in Iraq, but, or in India, rather. But they're not doing that great, unfortunately. They're pretty small. So... We've now talked a little bit about the groundwork for apocalypticism. What is it, right? We call it a religious mode. And I use the word mode there uh, for folks who have some background in philosophy, right? A mode of being. It's a, it's a way of doing religion. It's not a religion in itself, but it's an articulation within a religion. Um, it existed primarily, it began to exist primarily in Judaism, but obviously it will persist into Christianity. In fact, Christianity is just in many ways, apocalyptic Judaism perfected. It's when, in fact, apocalypticism becomes the religion, right? It's, the, when, it's when the shift completely goes over to one side and the apocalyptic is what really matters and Judaism becomes an adjunct riding on the tails of the apocalypticism. One can imagine Christianity that way, but also in Islam. Islam is also largely an apocalyptic uh, religion. Again, it's a religion based on a guy being shown thing by an angel. It's, an, it's fundamentally an apocalyptic religion. So what makes the apocalyptic? Now, what's important to know about this is that no one sat down in Judea or in Babylon and said, I'm going to invent apocalypticism. What they did was be religious and they innovated. And the, the specific religious innovations that they developed, we now call apocalypticism. 
right? So it's very important to note here, this is a scholarly term applied to an ancient people. And it's always important to know that when you do that, when you apply, when you apply a, a schema to ancient people, it never fits perfectly, right? Some things are left out, some things are left in, but it's such a, it, it's such a stable kind of scheme that we think it's, we do think that this is an important and decisive break with the prophetic religion of ancient Israel. So what makes apocalypticism apocalypticism? The first thing is what I mentioned here at the last, but I'll mention it first because the last will be first in the first, um, is the name apocalypticism, right? It comes from the word apocalypsis in Greek, which means to reveal or to uncover. And what's important about this literature is that what tends to group it all together is the idea that God is revealing something fundamental to the person, to the apocalyptic prophet. God's not speaking to the apocalyptic prophet, telling them, go condemn, you know, go condemn, uh, I don't know, uh, some king, somebody's like king, right? Go condemn those people for being bad and being rich. That's the way a prophet like Amos worked. God spoke and Amos went and said, right? Woe to you people, cows of Bashan. No, here we have God revealing various kinds of things to a human agent. And typically that's being mediated by a divine, semi-divine being, typically an angel. So an angel shows up and says, let me show you something. And what do they show them? All kinds of things. What kinds of things? Typically things like cosmology. Apocalypse Judaism is very interested in how the universe works. If you've ever read the Hebrew Bible, one of the things that is weirdly missing from the Hebrew Bible is any discussion of how the world is arranged, right? There's some vague discussions in the book of Genesis, but there's no real sense of like, what, what is the world exactly? Because they're not really interested in what is the world exactly, right? They're interested in what's going on in Judea with this king. So cosmology becomes very, very important in, uh, in the apocalyptic mode of Judaism. Also, they're very interested in the past. This is sometimes ironic considering that most people think of apocalypticism as primarily dealing with the future, but mostly the, the apocalypticists are interested in the past. So they're very interested in how did we get here? And the thing that they're very interested in is where did evil come from, right? Because if evil is in the world and it's out there, what kind of existence does it have? And they're very interested in where it came from. You'll never see much in the Hebrew Bible about them discussing the origins of evil, right? Even the whole talking snake in the Garden of Eden, the writer of that story in the book of Genesis never says, and that's where all evil comes from. It names some things, right? You have to work for your bread and women's uh, ch child pain and uh, the, the pain in having a child will increase. By the way, it says that the pain will increase. It never says there wasn't any. It just will get worse, right? So it never says, and that's why everything went off the rails, right? The apocalypticists will be very interested in this. Uh, also, they're very interested in the use of symbolism, right? The Bible doesn't do much in the way of symbolism often. Right, but the apocalypticists will be very interested in symbolism. Very, they're in fact virtually encoding their writings. And also, again, as I mentioned earlier with the ex eventu prophecy, they're going to be really interested in engaging in the same kind of social criticism that we saw in the historical Israelite prophets, but they're going to be doing it in a way that, in a literary form, in which they encode those criticisms by describing them as if they're happening in the future. Right. So they describe present events in an encoded way as if they're happening in the future. That's going to be a tip off for an apocalyptic writer. Amos didn't encode anything. He called people cows for being rich. He's like, you people are bad because you're rich and God hates you. Like he's not encoding anything. Like he's not like, and the cows will eat and become fat on the land. You no, know, he's like, I hate you people and God hates you too, right? That's not what they, these apocalyptic folks do. Also, what they're really interested in is oppression, right? They're very interested in oppression and tribulation. Specifically, why do bad things keep happening to us? If our God is the only God and we have a special relationship with this God, why did the Greeks just like whip our ass? Like, that's a bad thing. Like, we just got whipped by the Romans. They just killed like a bunch of us. Like, where are, what's going on, God? right? That's a real important question to ask, right? I mean, we all ask the sort of like, why do bad things happen to good, good people question? It's like, why did we all get wiped out? Or most of us, 
they're very interested in why this tribulation is happening, right? And again, I say tribulation. The idea is it's real bad for a while, but for the apocalypticists, God has a plan. And not only that, the apocalypticists claim to know the plan, right? They claim to know the plan. They're also at some level interested in the end of the world, right? Now, and I say end of the world, what they're really interested in is the righteous and the wicked being separated and the righteous being rewarded and the wicked being damned. There's no hint of that in the Israelite religion. Everybody in the Israelite religion went to the same un underworld, Sheol. It doesn't matter if you're a good person or a bad person. You went to the same place and it sucked. Well, the apocalypse is to say, that's not fair. Bad people will get punished. This idea comes directly probably from Zoroastrianism, right? So bad people get punished and the good people will get rewarded. That's the extent really of how things are gonna go down in the future. And of course, right, why does that make sense? Well, it makes sense because a lot of good people, or at least people they thought they were good, were suffering enormously under foreign occupation. They're also interested in otherworldly journeys, right? They're, they'll go to on journeys of the various realms of heaven, or they'll go on journeys to the various parts of the afterlife. It's very dualistic. That is to say, the world in apocalyptic literature is very starkly divided between the good guys and the bad guys, right? And the good guys are going to win, and the bad guys are going to lose. You don't see that in Israelite religion. In Israelite religion, the prophets are, you're doing bad, but if you do good, God will not punish you. In apocalypticism is, you are bad and God is gonna destroy you. It's a much more dualistic worldview, which again, if you study history in times of intense political crisis, right? Dualism emerges, the good guys and the bad guys, right? right? Whether it's the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, right? Or whether it's the sons of light versus the sons of darkness, polarize the world and that's often how you describe. Um, and again, I think even Marxism is a kind of apocalypticism in many ways. Uh, he would hate that idea but he can happily roll in his grave. Um, pay him back from that anti-Semitism on the Jewish question. Um, so at any rate, right? Uh, also what's really important about apocalypse, apocalypticism is someone's gonna fix all this, right? Because clearly, if you look at the time period being conquered by the Greek, being conquered by the Romans, being massacred by various people, it's pretty clear that we're not gonna be the ones to fix this. And so what do they say? There's going to be some kind of savior figure who's going to enter into history and fix all this. And that, of course, as it ferments a little while, becomes the fine wine of Messianism. That some person, or persons, by the way, early Messianism never agreed about how many it would be. Many people thought it would be two messiahs. And one of those would die, right? And another one would become a military general and win. So ancient Judaism was never clear about there being just one messiah. Many sections of Judaism actually believe there would be at least two. So right? Now the Christians fix that by like having him die and come back later. They're just waiting on that last part. Um, so they just, they kind of roll it into one dude, which is pretty smart. Uh, also, there's all kind of anti-Messiah characters, right? If you have a good guy fighting on the, for the good guys, you're going to have a bad guy fighting for the bad guys. That's the anti-Christ. And there are lots of different stories about the bad guys, right? Christianity really likes the bad guys too. Um, and they make for good movies. The structure of heaven and hells is going to be a big part of the apocalyptic world. If they're going to describe to you where you're going to go when you die or where you get resurrected, they want you to know about it. And if there's really vivid de depictions of the of the hellish worlds in the in the afterlife, it's pretty motivating. Like I don't want to go there where they like boil you in excrement forever. That sounds bad. I don't want to go there. I'm going to be a good guy, right? So they're very they're very interested in the structures of the various heavens and the hells, and they're also interested in the idea that behind the scenes of what's apparent to us the world is actually being dominated by a vast majority of, of uh, spiritual creatures. Typically, we now know them as angels and demons. And so, again, if you look at the Hebrew Bible, there are basically very little in terms of angels and demons. They kind of show up from time to time, right? But in the apocalyptic, they are everywhere. Angels and demons are literally all around you engaging in titanic spiritual warfare for the destiny of the world. Right, and every country has its own angel. Right, Michael's the angel of this country. Gabriel's the angel of this country, and every country has their own demon, etc. So, the scale of things is also bigger. In Israelite literature, they kind of don't like the Egyptians, and they kind of don't like the Assyrians. But you never have a global analysis of the world because they're kind of a parochial people. The apocalyptic writers are not parochial. 
they imagine the entire world divided into countries and they explain political science in terms of this spiritual battles that are going on behind the scenes that we don't see. Their literature, which we'll talk about more in just a moment, is typically pseudo-anonymous, although they like to claim that very ancient people wrote them. So Enoch wrote this, or Abraham wrote this, or, uh, or uh, Shem right, wrote this. So they like to allege ancient uh, authorship um, uh, because, you know, if it's just like Menachem, the dude down the street wrote this, who cares, right? Like Manny wrote a book about angels? Like, yeah, Manny, the guy, you know, the guy that like fixes our shoes, like the hell does he know? Right. So, you know, Manny the shoe guy, Manny the cobbler is like, nah, -uh. Enoch wrote this. Right. And so he puts Enoch's name on it. Right. A patriarch who never died and was like, you know, Noah's grandfather, or whatever. Uh, or father. Uh, yeah. Noah's, uh, Noah's father. Like, yeah, Enoch, that dude. Yeah. He was real. Let's read his book. Right. So you throw a name on like Abraham on there and people are willing to read your book. They're not going to read Manny's book about the end of the world. No one cares about what Manny thinks. So let's talk about this literature, right? Let's get into uh, what makes this work, right? Why would anyone write all this stuff down? Well, the first is historical and psychological. You're living as Judahites in a world of theological and political turmoil, right? Now, I don't know about you. I don't like turmoil. And when my life is in turmoil, one of the things I try to figure out is, why is this happening to me? Right? Because we think, because we're stupid, that if we understand something, we get power over it. You don't. Right? You can be real smart, and they basically just like throw you into a jail or whatever. Right? But it, and again, if bad things are happening to you, you won't understand why. There's no person I don't think of. Right? You can be as existentialist as the day is long, right? and you're still going to want to know what's going on. Why is it happening? Right? Why is this happening? Very few people are going to suffer through immense, like, physical and psychological turmoil and think to themselves, okay, guess that just happened, right? Most people don't do that. So what do they do? They try to explain why it's happening. Further, right, not only do they want to explain why it's happening, they want to feel like it's not for no reason. No one likes the idea that you just went through a traumatic experience and it's meaningless. You're on a rock, three from the sun in the middle of a void. And in 4 billion years, the sun's gonna swallow this planet and every bad thing that's ever happened to you is not only not gonna be a memory, this earth won't even exist. We don't wanna, that doesn't make sense from a human perspective. We wanna understand why our traumas are happening. And we want our traumas to mean something. And so what do they mean? Well, the overwhelming data we get from the apocaly apocalyptic literature is that God has planned every single thing that's happening in the world. So this is a very deterministic literature and that your suffering is not random. It's part of a plan. And what's that plan? The end of the world, right? The world is going in a very specific direction and God is going to make things right. Punishing the wicked, rewarding the righteous. This is all part of the plan. Uh, I think awesome. I wouldn't need you a lot tonight. What's that? What's wrong with me? Um, right? No, I think Nietzsche said, right, that the, the, person who has, uh, the person who has a why can endure any how, right? The person that has a why can endure any how. They can, people can, you know, people that people can get through anything if as long as they have a reason why it's happening to them, right? I think I may have that backwards, right? And so the idea here, right, is that basically what you get is you get a reason why this is happening to you. And what's the reason? It's all part of a plan. And the apocalypticist has been revealed that plan. Lastly, lastly, a big part of this entire whole drama is that no one likes being colonized. No one likes being oppressed. No one likes having their country destroyed by foreigners. No one likes foreigners moving into their country and taking all their stuff and enslaving them. No one's really about that. That's bad. And so you want to protest against it, right? You want to protest against it, right? When the Algerian, when the French come into Algeria and destroy that country, the Algerians are like, we ain't having it, right? And they protest against it. Now, there are a lot of different ways you can protest. One way of protesting is militarily trying to fight the Romans. You can try that. And people did. And they had very limited success. You can also write books about how they're bad and God hates them and God's going to judge them and God's going to kill them eventually. 
Now, again, as I said earlier, you can't come out and just write that that way, right? Boo the Romans, you know, you know Tiberius sucks and God's going to kill him. And the Romans going to be like, that's interesting. How would you like to be crucified, right? So they're going to do that. They're going to encode it. And if you know, you know, right? Hamavin yavin, right? If you know, you know, and anyone who knew how to read this literature could read the code. And they're like, yeah, the Romans, they're going to get their ass whooped by this God and whoop their ass. And they're like, yeah. And the Romans are like, what are you reading? Like nothing, all right? So that was a way of encoding this. Now, how does all this work? God has to tell you. God has to reveal to you the plan, you, the apocalyptic prophet. And that's what this literature is. It's the plan. It's the way the world is structured. God built the world. God structured the world. History itself is unfolding according to very set rules set down by God. And everything is part of the plan. Everything's part of the plan. And the apocalyptic literature is marked by that revealing, that uncovering. As you might imagine, in a world of turmoil, which I know Jewish people go through turmoil, right? Every once in a while, there's a little turmoil here and there, right? Little turmoil. You can imagine this was an incredibly persuasive form of religiosity. It explained why the world was the way it was, right? It, it described why bad things were happening. It told you where it all came from. It tells you how it's going to all end. And it tells you that the things that you're going through as a people and as an individual are not random. And they're not punishment from God, right? Also, by the old Israelite theology, every bad thing that's happened to you is punishment from Yahweh, right? No, you're suffering because that's part of the plan in which Yahweh is secretly collaborating and is going to whoop these people. That idea, I don't know about you, right, is one of the most seductive ideas imaginable. And again, when I track this onto things like, again, folks may know, I, I wrote my dis, my dissertation on Marx. It's difficult to read much Marxist propaganda as anything other than repackage apocalypticism right? It reads very much like an apocalyptic literature, right? Evil emerged with, with various modes of production, right? That's being driven forward by history, and eventually it's going to come to a cataclysmic battle, and then after that, everything's going to be great, right? Dictatorship, the proletariat, or whatever. You're like, didn't we heard this already, right? But Marx is like, it's material now, son. It's not God doing it. It's, it's history. So you can, again, you can see how influential this has been. The apocalyptic form of literature flourished for hundreds of years. One could even argue for a thousand years, beginning roughly about 350 BCE and extending all the way through in the Middle Ages, honestly, right? Because, you know, Jews with the turmoil, yeah, it continued. And so it, the apocalyptic literature kept being produced. Christianity is in many ways an apocalyptic religion. It's a religion that more forcefully accepts the apocalyptic paradigm than any other form of Judaism, with the exceptions of the Essenes, those folks living at Qumran that wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. They believed it so much, by the way, that when the Romans, when the Jews revolted against the Romans, the folks that lived at that site, if Josephus can be trusted to do anything other than make Josephus look good, um, they fought. They thought the world was about to come to its final end. They tried to organize a resistance to the Romans. They were massacred at two battles. And guess what? They stored other scrolls in the caves near their buildings, and they never came back for them. Why? Because they were dead, because they thought this was all part of the plan. Lucky for us, the scrolls set there more or less for a couple thousand years, and now we have them. And we can even see in the literature where they're planning for this battle, even describing the banners and horns that they will be blowing and carrying in the battle. And I bet you, when that legion of Roman soldiers were like, why are they blowing horns and stuff, right? And then they, they were like, that, did they think that's going to work? And then the Romans massacred them, and they left their scrolls there. Apocalypse is a hell of a drug. I mean, like, when you literally believe God is gonna intervene on your behalf at the very last moment to save you, if that's your battle plan, stay home, right? If that's your strategy, and that was their strategy, it seems. Many of the big books of the, of the Hebrew Bible, like the book of Daniel, is imbued with apocalypticism. The War Scroll in the Dead Sea Scrolls is a, a very apocalyptic text. Perhaps the most famous apocalyptic text of all time is the book of Enoch, a book not included in either Christian or Jewish literature, but preserved, thank God by the heroic people of Ethiopia who have never been colonized, FYI, um, because they fought like the devil to have it not happen and they're brilliant tacticians. 
but they preserved all these writings that are so important in Judaism. So anytime I think about the what the Ethiopian people have done to preserve write, Jewish writings, I am in enormous thanks for what they've done. So what's going to also happen, and we'll get to this next time, is that apocalypticism is also going to give rise to a new form of mysticism called the Merkava mysticism, which we'll be discussing next time. How do you get this vision? How do you go see what God has to show you or what angels have to show you? Well, spiritual techniques were developed for this and a new form of mysticism arose as a subset of apocalypticism in which mystics described going into God's palaces and being shown this stuff. We'll get to them next week. It's scary. Um, as you might imagine, I don't mess with any angels. Apocalyptic Judaism, right, and rabbinical Judaism, however, never quite saw eye to eye. The rabbis never fully embraced apocalypticism, right? Because the rabbis are all about the day-to-day -day keeping on of sort of religious survival, not the titanic battle at the end, right? The rabbis are more like, how do we do Judaism now the temple's destroyed? How do we move the temple into our home? And the apocalyptic people out there are being like, God's going to judge these people tomorrow, right? So in many ways, apocalyptic Judaism was never quite meshed with rabbinical Judaism. And again, one famous, I give you just one famous quote from the, from the, um, the, the Talmud, right? It says that for every time you try to calculate when the Messiah will come, God delays the coming of the Messiah, the years that you calculated in the future. The rabbis don't like this, right? When Rabbi Akiva said, right, that Shimon Bar Kokhba is the Messiah and will save us all, the other rabbis made fun of him. They're like, grass will grow in your cheeks before the Messiah comes. Like, that, that's not going to happen. Unfortunately, grass didn't grow in his cheeks because he didn't get buried because he was burned alive for supporting the Bar Kokhba rebellion. So sometimes history is mean, right? The apocalyptic is very, very dangerous, but it was incredibly popular. On the screen right now is a short list of all the, of the apocalyptic literature from this time period. If I were to grab my uh, collection of apocalyptic literature off the shelf, it would be longer than the Hebrew Bible. An enormous amount of literature, right, was produced in the apocalyptic genre. Dozens of books that were very popular. For instance, at the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are more copies of the Book of Enoch than there are copies of Leviticus. That's Torah, folks. That's like the Torah, the Torah. There are more copies of the Book of Enoch there, right? They're more interested in Enoch if we, can, if we can take the amount of scrolls they had, right, as, a, as, a, as any indication. So the apocalyptic literature was incredibly important. And even with the rise of Christianity, it didn't stop being produced. We have dozens of Christian apocalyptic texts, right, including the Apocalypse of John, but other ones. And you might be asking why. Well, Jesus had that pesky habit of not coming back soon enough. And Christians underwent turmoil too. They were being persecuted by the Roman Empire. They were being uh, marginalized by, uh, by the Jewish people that didn't really like them. They thought they were weird. Um, they faced their own turmoil. Jesus wasn't coming back and people started dying. Well, what do we do with people dying and Jesus not coming back year after year after year? Well, you invent further and further apocalyptic ideas about what's going on. And the persecutions are all part of the plan, right? Martyrdom becomes a thing you should rush into because it's part of God's plan, right? It's part of God's plan. Of course, also in the Islamic literature, apocalypticism would also become enormously influential and many apocalyptic Christian and Jewish ideas also make their appearance in the Quran. Uh, the Dajjal is a good example of a sort of antichrist character of the Battle of Gog and Magog, uh, uh, the main battle at the end of the world, uh, which occurs in the book of Daniel and is translated into the book of uh, the Battle of Megiddo in the, um, in the Christian literature. Uh, even the return of Jesus and the resurrection of the dead, these are all apocalyptic ideas that also occur in Islam. So Islam is also deeply influenced and in some sense an apocalyptic re religion in itself. Judaism is going to increasingly abandon apocalypticism. And the answer for that is the same answer why the book of, Ra the book of Maccabees is not included in the Bible. The rabbis, right? And also by the way, why the Hanukkah festival is not about the Maccabees, it's about a miracle. The reason why, D disastrous rebellion after disastrous rebellion, the rabbis didn't want any more Rambos. They were tired of that machismo, we're gonna fight the Roman stuff because it just got us killed. So they said, we're not doing that anymore and we're not gonna prioritize that. 
And so as you can imagine, this apocalyptic literature really gears people up to do rather extreme things, right? To, because again, they all think it's part of the plan and God's going to intervene in history and do whatever. And it doesn't happen. Over and over and over again, it doesn't come to pass. But the rabbis don't like this. They think it's dangerous and they marginalize it. And eventually rabbinical Judaism, right, moves past apocalyptic literature and very little of it gets produced, or not so much, very little gets produced in the aftermath of uh, the 135 rebellion by Bar Kokhba, but there is some, right? There are some texts that do get produced like the Apocalypse of the Ten Signs um, and Perkei Mashiach and, um, and things like this. So the literature does survive a little bit longer. Just to say, just to wrap up for tonight, folks, uh, needless to say, apocalypticism as a mode of, relig of religiosity, I would argue is the most enduring mode of religiosity in the world today so endearing that apocalyptic ideas have entered e even into things like Buddhism, right? Apocalyptic ideas flowing from this tradition have entered, even entered into things like Buddhism. Om Shirinko is a good example of an apocalyptic quasi-Buddhist sect. Um, you may remember them for uh, having poisoned uh, the subway system in Japan with sarin gas in the 1990s as part of an apocalyptic agenda. To this day, uh, uh, in a 2012 poll, Nearly 15% of people worldwide believe the world will end in their lifetime. That's millions of people, folks. That's hundreds of millions of people that believe the world's going to end in their lifetime. That's an apocalyptic idea, right? And apocalyptic sects are a huge part of American religiosity. One can think of the Branch Davidians out there in Waco, Texas, um, and uh, other, kinds of, uh, other kinds of things. And again, of course, those folks... Uh, Part of the reason what motivated them to stay in that building was an, apoc an apocalyptic understanding of history. And of course that probably led to them being massacred by the US government. Um, they had their own hand to play in it too, but I, I do think that that was pretty significant mismanagement. Uh, uh, at any rate, while rabbinical Judaism and Kabbalah are gonna win the day over and against apocalypticism, apocalypticism was enormously important over the course of about 500 years in Judaism specifically, and it has made an enormous impact on world religiosity. I might even argue, like I said earlier, that apocalypticism as a mode of religiosity is perhaps the dominant religious mode in the world today, in the world today, right? I, I, would, I, would, I would be willing to make that argument, I think. But uh, what's going to emerge in terms of mysticism for the purposes of our, our, our learning together is that a form of apocalyptic, pra practical apocalypticism, that is to say, a mysticism in which mystics attempt to descend into the throne room of God, is going to emerge out of the apocalyptic literature. And that form of mysticism is going to be what we'll be tackling next week called Merkava mysticism, Merkava, chariot mysticism. You also may know the word Merkava because the Israelis have named a tank, their, their equivalent of the M1 Abrams after, uh, after the, the chariot of God, which just seems inappropriate for a lot of reasons. Um, but at any rate, uh, what I want to put on the, the screen right now are just some recommended readings. If you want to grab these ISBNs, and I also I'm going to share these slides with everybody uh, for the class so you can have access to the slides later. But if you want a great uh, apocalyptic literature reader, just, just a collection of apocalyptic literature, uh, this is a really great text by Reddish. Uh, the large scholar of apocalypticism uh, in the world now is John J. Collins. His book, The Apocalyptic Imagination, is the definitive study of apocalypticism. It's the book. Right. If you take a, a college level class in apocalypticism, uh, you'd be reading uh, Collins's book. If you're interested in Christian apocalypticism, uh, Bernard McGinn, the leading scholar in Christian mysticism, has written a really great book about apocalyptic traditions in the Middle Ages. People like Joachim of Fiore, who was nuts in the most amazing way possible. Uh, and of course, also John Reeves has published uh, another text on trajectories in uh, Near Eastern apocalypticism. And this actually covers uh, uh, Jewish apocalypticism through the Middle Ages, which doesn't get much play, mostly because a lot of it's not been translated, but uh, Reeves provides uh, a great uh, introduction to that literature, which is also forms of apocalypticism that survive into Jewish apocalypticism that survives into the Middle Ages. So again, another form of mysticism that emerges from the breakdown of prophecy, but renovates prophecy to do a phenomenologically different task to show rather than tell and show what the whole plan of the universe and how you as a Jew, right? Or as a non-Jew, maybe as a Roman, how you fit into it, right? And that form of mysticism, I think is just incredibly important. Christianity 
I mean, we all seen these, you know, Christian folks that are predicting the world or whatever. Um, it's none of this is imaginable without the apocalyptic turn uh, in Judaism during uh, beginning in the fourth century BCE. Welcome back and thank you for joining me as I explore the garden that is Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah. Again, if you'd like to support my work of providing accessible, free, and scholarly content on topics like Kabbalah, alchemy, and the occult, along with magic and hermetic philosophy, consider supporting my work on Patreon or perhaps with a one-time donation. You can find those links below. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.